everybody. If you are just joining us um, today, we have Josh who's going to talk about hydrangeas and we're going to get started here in just about a minute. We'll give people some time to find the stream. So just hang on for a few seconds and we'll get started. Okay, looks like we have a little bit of an audience. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for this Get Gardening series. Um, we are gonna, we have a couple more planned through the beginning of September. So next week we're gonna do some fall garden planning information with Galen Johnson. Then we have a whole series of home preservation um, speakers and then we're gonna do some fall gardening. So that's all coming up today. We have Josh Cardos. Thank you very much for joining us, Josh, who's gonna talk about hydrangeas. So I'm gonna turn it over to Josh and he can tell you a little bit about um, his position and um, what he does for the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences. All right, let me get this set up. All right, Devin, is that showing properly? You see the presentation? Okay, good. Okay, so as Devin said, uh, my name is Josh Pardos. Um, I'm a horticulture instructor at Virginia Tech, teaching several classes, uh, plant propagation, herbaceous landscape, plants, uh, greenhouse management, um, indoor plants, ornamental plant production and marketing. Um, I have a PhD in horticulture from the University of Georgia. Uh, hydrangeas are near and dear to me as uh, hydrangeas are what I worked on for my dissertation. So my research was on hydrangea breeding. Um, I've actually worked in the horticulture industry for about 14 years. I've uh, worked in, re or excuse me, not 14 years, since I was 14. Um, yeah, so a little longer than 14 years. Uh, actually, gosh, going on like 26 years. Um, so I've worked in retail garden center. I've worked in various wholesale production nurseries uh, with annuals, perennials, uh, shrubs and trees. <clears throat> um, after my, after graduate school, I worked for seven years uh, for a plant breeding company, breeding mainly um, woody flowering shrubs. Uh, worked a lot with hydrangeas uh, there also. And then for four years, I was with an international vegetable grafting companies. So working in a high-tech greenhouse, it was a brand new facility. Uh, learned a lot about um, greenhouses and vegetables and grafting, which has nothing to do with the talk today. Learned a lot about uh, managing people, leading people, which is not anything I had learned in horticulture. So uh, pretty vast background within the industry. And now I'm uh, using my experiences to teach students, to instruct as cheesy as it might sound, the next generation of students and to really bring uh, my experiences to the classroom. So uh, with that, today we're going to talk about hydrangeas and we'll talk about um, the uh, three mistakes that are most commonly made with hydrangeas and how we can avoid those mistakes. Uh, let's see, sorry, I'm not my screen is not advancing. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, but first, what are hydrangeas? Maybe, um, maybe you're on this <clears throat> webinar, this Facebook Live, and you already know a lot about hydrangeas. Maybe you don't know much. Maybe you've heard of them. But what are they? Well, hydrangeas are a group of popular flowering shrubs. Um, it's important that we note that they're flowering shrubs. Uh, some plants are grown for their foliage or their leaves. Some plants are grown for their flowers, some grown for both, but hydrangeas are most widely known for their flowers. Uh, the flowers are usually pretty large and they come in a range of colors depending on the type of hydrangea. They can be white or pink or blue, sometimes purple and red. Uh, really the only colors that we don't see in hydrangeas are yellows and oranges, um, but most people uh, will think of blue hydrangeas, which blues are not a very common color uh, when it comes to, to flowers. And that's something that we can absolutely obtain with hydrangeas. 
Uh, one thing about hydrangeas is that all of them are deciduous, meaning that they're going to lose their leaves in winter. So if we think of an oak tree, for an example, uh, they shed their leaves in winter and then they flush new leaves the next spring. All hydrangeas do that. None of them are evergreen. Um, many people would consider hydrangeas to be nostalgic. And what I mean by this is perhaps you had a family member, uh, a parent, a mother, a father, or a grandparent that grew hydrangeas. Um, that's uh, actually my grandmother grew hydrangeas, grew a lot of hydrangeas. Uh, I planted many of them. Uh, my grandmother's the one that got me interested in plants and horticulture. And so when I think of plants, I think of her. When I think of hydrangeas, I think of her. So maybe for some of you, uh, hydrangeas would bring back a memory of a grandparent or a parent. Uh, maybe you've driven around, especially in the southeast, and seen a hydrangea growing near like an old homestead. Uh, the home might be dilapidated, but the hydrangea is still growing. Uh, for some of you, maybe you think of Martha Stewart, or maybe you have no idea who Martha Stewart is. Um, hydrangeas had kind of fallen out of fashion, and Martha Stewart really championed hydrangeas, started talking about how great they were, and that really reinvigorated a lot of people to be interested in hydrangeas and, and provided kind of a boost uh, to plant breeders to develop new cultivars, new types of hydrangeas. So, um, but unfortunately, many gardeners do not have success with hydrangeas. So we're gonna talk about some of the most common mistakes and how we can avoid those. Okay, so the first mistake that many people make is choosing the wrong plant, or we could say choosing the wrong site or the wrong plant for the site. Um, so oftentimes when it comes to plants, uh, people buy plants as an impulse purchase. Um, some people, yes, get in their car and they go to a garden center with a particular plant or a particular site in mind, and they're looking for a plant that fits that site. Many people get in their car and they go to Home Depot or they go to Lowe's or they go to some other store and they're going to buy paint or something else and you see these bright plants as you drive past the garden center and you just buy one because it's attractive but you really have no idea what to do with it or where you're going to put it. So ideally what you do is you first determine where you're going to plant the hydrangea then you choose the appropriate type based on the site. So when I talk about the site, I'm mainly talking about sun exposure. So there are hydrangeas that specifically need full sun. There are ones that do really well in nearly full shade. And there's a lot of plants that do well in part sun and part shade. Um, other things when it comes to the site would be, you know, is it well drained or does it stay kind of moist? Um, so other ways that you can help identify which type of hydrangea might do well is to just look at the other plants in that area. What type of plants are they? Are they doing well or are they not? And this is information that can help you to choose the right plant. But on the most basic level, choose where you want to plant it and then observe that site over the course of maybe a couple of days or a week. Now used to this was kind of difficult because you know most of us drove and went and worked somewhere other than our house. And so it might take you a while to see this site throughout the, you know, the course of a day, uh, now a lot of us are working from home. So it's actually pretty easy to just look out there every hour, every couple of hours and see, uh, does that site get you know, morning sun? Does it get afternoon sun? Is it filtered sun? What does it look like? So identify the site, uh, primarily talking about sun exposure, and then we can talk about how to choose the right hydrangea. Okay, so if you've determined that your site is pretty much full sun or mostly sun, uh, really there's one type of hydrangea that's going to be best for that situation, and that would be panicle hydrangea. Anyone who's into scientific names, that's hydrangea paniculata, uh, but it's named panicle hydrangea because the flowers are in this panicle or sort of a triangle shape or like an inverted cone. Uh, they're usually going to be white. Um, sometimes they'll age to pink, they might age to kind of a chartreuse color, or maybe they just turn brown, but typically they're going to be white. Uh, panicle hydrangea can get pretty large, but there are dwarf or compact selections, so it's important, again, when we think about the site, not just sun exposure, but how much room do you have. Some of these plants may get 10 or 12 feet tall and wide, but if you only have space for a three to four or five foot shrub, it's important to note that so you can choose the right selection. Um, 
all plants are native to somewhere. We talk about native plants. A lot of people are interested in native plants. Uh, if you are interested in plants native to the US, this is one that is not. It is native to Japan and China. But if you have a full sun site and you want a hydrangea, this is really going to be your best option. OK, any type of hydrangea or any type of plant for that matter, they're going to be selections. We can call these cultivars or varieties. And that's kind of beyond the scope of uh, this presentation today to get into those distinctions. But uh, just be aware of the fact when you go to purchase a plant, um, it's going to have a tag. It should have a tag. If you go to purchase a plant and there's no tag, there's no label, that's probably not the best plant. You want to look for one with a label. It's going to have a name. It's going to tell you what the plant is, what the name of the selection is. It's going to have information about does it need sun or shade, how large it gets, perhaps some information about how to water or fertilize. But in any case, you're wanting to go and purchase a specific selection. So some of these that I recommend of Hydrangea paniculata would be limelight, Little Lime, Strawberry Sunday, and Bobo. I just want to say I, I don't benefit from any of these. Uh, these are not plants that uh, I receive any money for. I'm not being paid to promote these. These are just some plants that do well, that have kind of stood the test of time, and there are some good selections of panicle hydrangea. OK, so moving on, if you have determined that your site uh, receives part sun or part shade, um, then you actually are in luck because you have the widest group of plants to choose from when it comes to hydrangeas. <clears throat> if you have a part sun site, you could still plant panicle hydrangea, but just keep in mind it's going to do best in full sun. Uh, if you have a site that receives some morning shade and afternoon sun, panicle hydrangea would still do pretty well there. Uh, but other options you have would be smooth hydrangea or hydrangea arborescens. Uh, similar to panicle hydrangea, the flowers are usually white. There are a few pink selections, though these typically don't, they're not quite as vigorous, they're not quite as disease resistant, uh, but typically they're going to be white. Now, this plant is smaller in size than the normal panicle hydrangea. I would say a moderate size, about three to five feet. Most gardens have, a, have room for a three to five foot plant. Um, these plants are native to much of the eastern U.S. So if you're interested in natives, uh, obviously there's selections made, uh, but the species, hydrangea arborescens or smooth hydrangea, is native to the eastern U.S. And some of the recommended selections would be Annabelle, which is what is seen in the picture here. Annabelle's been around for a very long time, has large white flowers, <clears throat> and then Invincible Limetta. There are other options, though, if you have this part sun, part shade site. Uh, the next one being big leaf hydrangea or hydrangea macrophylla. Now, big leaf hydrangea is the hydrangea that a lot of people think about when they think of hydrangeas. If you've ever been to Cape Cod, if you've ever looked at a magazine cover and seen hydrangeas, most of the time they're going to feature big leaf hydrangea. This is the species that gives us the, the widest range of flower colors. Uh, we can have plants that are white or pink or blue, even purples and reds. Uh, so if you want um, blue, for sure, it would have to be a big leaf hydrangea. Um, when we talk about um, big leaf hydrangea, this is one that's native to Japan. So if you are interested in plants native in the US, this would not be a good option. But if you're, especially if you're wanting blue flowers, if you have this part sun site, part shade site, then I would highly recommend big leaf hydrangea. It's best to choose a reblooming cultivar. Again, I, I could talk to you for days about hydrangeas, and we're just touching on some things today. But when we talk about big leaf hydrangeas, a lot of the older selections or older cultivars that have been around don't flower as reliably. So there's some newer genetics that have been developed um, that have this reblooming characteristic, which essentially just means that they flower more reliably. So choosing a reblooming cultivar is important. And I can recommend the Endless Summer series. Uh, within that series, there's different selections, such as the original Summer Crush, Bloomstruck. Uh, Bloomstruck is the plant that's shown in this upper picture. And you see a range of colors there from kind of uh, nearly purple to light blue. 
And I do want to note that when we talk about a part sun or part shade site, um, it is important that we consider what time of day that site receives the sun or the shade because afternoon sun is more intense than morning sun. So for example, big leaf hydrangea would prefer in a part shade site to have morning sun and afternoon shade. Uh, that's where it would do best. If you have this type of site, uh, we also have the option of oak leaf hydrangea or hydrangea quercifolia. That's the plant shown in the bottom picture. Um, you're seeing a trend here where panicle hydrangea, smooth hydrangea, and now oak leaf are primarily white in color. Some of these may age to pink, but primarily we're talking about white flowers. Oak leaf hydrangea can actually get pretty large. Some of these get large and widespread with age. So it's important uh, that you consider that, consider that you have space for that plant or choose one of the selections that's more compact. Uh, there is a benefit um, if you're into native plants and that oak leaf hydrangea is native uh, to the Southeast US. Um, some of these plants can be a little bit sensitive of cold weather. Uh, so in Southwestern Virginia, we're generally okay. We generally don't have a problem. As you move further north, you may have some dieback on oak leaf hydrangea. It may be a little bit sensitive to cold. Um, recommended selections would be jet stream, which is what's shown in this bottom picture. And you see very dark green, clean leaves, uh, large white flowers in a pretty compact habit. It's not this big sprawly shrub. It's nice and compact. And then also ruby slippers, which is one that flowers with white flowers that then age to kind of a ruby red color. Okay, so we've talked about full sun. We've talked about a part sun, part shade site. What if you have full shade or nearly full shade? Um, any of the ones that we said would work in part sun, part shade will do okay, but the best one for full shade would be the big leaf hydrangea. Uh, it's gonna perform the best. And it's actually with that range of flower colors really gives you some bright colors in a dark shady spot. So if you look at these pictures, especially the bottom right hand corner, this is a woodland garden uh, with an overstory of, uh, of trees and you can really see those colors kind of popping in the shade. So uh, big leaf hydrangea would be your best option for a shaded site. Okay, so we've evaluated the site, we've chosen the appropriate plant uh, so now the next mistake that people commonly make is to prune hydrangeas at the wrong time. Remember that we talked about hydrangeas being deciduous, they drop their leaves. So this is a picture of big leaf hydrangea in the winter. What do you see? Well, kind of some ugly brown stems. And typically what people do is they go out in winter and they cut these back and they either cut them back pretty far and even to the ground, or maybe halfway back, um, that's not always the correct time to prune. So the correct time to prune hydrangeas depends on the species. More accurately, it depends on when the plants set flower buds. So let's talk about when we prune hydrangeas. Okay, so some hydrangeas we would prune in the winter or spring. Those would be smooth hydrangea and panicle hydrangea. These two we can prune any time after the plants have gone dormant, which is they've dropped their leaves. Um, obviously, this is these plants are dormant. It's the middle of winter. There's snow on the plants. So anytime after they've gone dormant up until early spring, we don't want to wait until we see new leaves or new shoots emerging. But anytime in that window, uh, we can prune. And I'm, I'm not going to get into types of pruning, how much to prune. There's a lot of different uh, reasons you would prune different ways, but the reason we can prune these plants during the winter or early spring is that these two types of hydrangeas produce flower buds on new growth. So when they push out new growth in the spring, it will produce flower buds and flower reliably that season. <clears throat> okay, so what about the other two types of hydrangeas that we talked about? <clears throat> Big leaf hydrangea and oak leaf hydrangea. These two should be pruned immediately after flowering in the summer. So if we go back to this picture, this is a dormant big leaf hydrangea. Um, some people will prune it during the winter, especially because they think the stems are dead. So one trick is you can go and you can scratch the bark with your thumb 
And if you see green underneath, those stems are not dead, they're still alive. So you definitely would not want to prune those. So big leaf hydrangea and oak leaf hydrangea, we want to prune them right after they finish flowering. So this picture is a picture of an oak leaf hydrangea. Remember these, these would have been white uh, when they were at their peak, when they were fully open. Now the flowers have turned brown. This would be the time to prune. Uh, again, the <clears throat> amount of pruning you do depends on what your goal is. It could be as simple as cutting those flowers off. It could be a heavier pruning. It could be pruning to remove certain shoots. Maybe it's starting to grow out over a sidewalk or something like that. But you want to prune them in summer after flowering. And this will give these plants time to produce new growth later that summer and set flower buds for the next year. That's very, very important because these plants set flower buds at the end of the summer for the next year. We want to avoid pruning in the fall though, is this will encourage new growth going into winter and this new growth can be damaged by cold weather. So late summer, avoid pruning in fall though. I do wanna note that some cultivars of big leaf hydrangeas flower on new growth. So the ones, remember I, I mentioned reblooming when we talked about big leaf hydrangeas, these um, can still be pruned in summer. So the easiest thing to remember with big leaf and oak leaf is to prune in summer. Okay, the final mistake that people commonly make is not watering and fertilizing hydrangeas properly. All hydrangeas have, a relatively, have relatively large leaves. In fact, remember the plant in this picture is called big leaf hydrangea. So they all have relatively large leaves and they have a relatively high water requirement. Uh, generally plants with larger leaves are going to use and lose more water than plants with smaller leaves. So I think that we would all agree that supplemental watering, when I say supplemental, I mean anytime you are going out and watering the plant through an irrigation system, a watering can, a water hose, <clears throat> anything other than rain. So supplemental watering is obviously beneficial for new plants, but it's also beneficial for established plants, especially during hot and droughty periods. So this is a big leaf hydrangea that is stressed. It's wilting, it's experiencing water stress or drought stress. <clears throat> and this is a plant that you see it's flowering, but those flowers are not very showy. You actually see that they're starting to turn brown, they're wilted. Uh, so giving some supplemental water and some fertilizer will really help the plants to perform at their best. Uh, producing flowers is stressful. It takes a lot of energy from a plant to produce flowers. So if we can give it a little bit of water, a little bit of fertilizer, that's going to go a long way to maximizing flowering. Uh, I want to make a quick comment about watering. Again, watering, I, we could talk for hours about how to water plants. But one thing, not that you would want to listen for hours about how to water plants. So I'll keep it short. Uh, one thing you want to keep in mind is less frequent watering, but deeper is better. So as an example, if you drink coffee and every day you finish your coffee and you fill your coffee mug with water and you walk out the door and you pour that on your hydrangea and that's all that plant gets and it's getting it every day, that's not good. That's not much water and it's too frequent. It's not encouraging a deep root system. You would be better off to fill a gallon jug with water and to water that plant every few days so that that water is going deeper and it's encouraging a deeper root system. Fertilizer is another point that um, there's a lot of details that's beyond the scope of this talk, but really any general purpose fertilizer for outdoor plants for shrubs will work. Uh, don't use a fertilizer specifically for orchids or specifically for house plants, but any general purpose outdoor fertilizer will work. Just follow the label. It will give you directions about rates and about timing to apply that fertilizer. Okay, so in summary, you want to choose the correct type of hydrangea based on the site that you have selected. <clears throat> Prune it at the correct time of year. Give it some supplemental water, especially during hot and droughty periods and a little bit of fertilizer. And you can enjoy the beautiful flowers and really be the envy of your neighbors and your gardening friends. So you can be the person that has hydrangeas that look like the magazine covers, or I guess I should be more current and say like what you see on Instagram or Facebook. 
Uh, I still think about like walking through the grocery store and seeing the magazine covers. Uh, I didn't grow up with with social media. So, uh, but yeah, like what you see on social media now, those can be your pictures. Uh, I, I want to give one plug uh, for more information. Um, there is a publication that I've linked here and it is uh, from Virginia Cooperative Extension. It's publication Hort-84P. And this was actually put together by Alex Namera, who is a professor of horticulture here at Virginia Tech, teaches a number of classes, but one of those is uh, woody landscape plants identification and use. And he put together a very good uh, publication, not just about hydrangeas, but it's about selecting plants for Virginia landscapes, uh, specifically showy flowering shrubs. And he talks about hydrangeas and other shrubs and how to select the proper plants for your landscape. So with that, uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you for attending and I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Josh. That was a really great presentation. We have a lot of questions about this. People have a lot of trouble with their ideas, <laughs> including me. Um, so a couple questions about starting new hydrangeas. What's the best time of year to plant a hydrangea? And then should you fertilize in the first year after you plant it? Sure. So um, you can plant plants at any time of the year and different people will tell you different things. Uh, I would say probably the best time to plant a hydrangea is going to be spring. Uh, as soon as uh, the ground is warmed up just a bit, uh, that gives you the opportunity to water that plant. Yes, I would fertilize that plant. I would mulch that plant and you can get some good root growth in that first year and uh, have that plant get established. Um, you can also plant in fall and that will work, um, but I would say that planting in spring gives you the spring and the summer to observe that plant and you can see wilting and you can really gauge things like water needs better than you can through fall and winter. Uh, yes, I would fertilize, again, just following the label recommendations. If anything, um, be a little conservative. Uh, you can burn plants with fertilizer. Uh, so if you're concerned, you could use a slow release fertilizer. Um, Osmocote is one brand name so that it would reduce the risk of fertilizer burn by putting too much on at one time. Another good question. Um, so someone has a hydrangea that they um, bought at the store and planted and the flowers have changed from blue to now a green color. <laughs> yes, okay, so flower color and hydrangeas. Uh, this is always a fun one. Um, I, th if it started out blue, that's gonna be a big leaf hydrangea. Um, usually the question I receive is, why was my hydrangea pink when I bought it and it turned blue when I put it in the ground or the other way around? Um, if it was blue and it has turned green, that's just the flowers aging. So as the flowers age, actually, is my screen still being shared, Devin? Okay. Um, so if we go back to this slide, if you look at the upper picture, if you look at this, I don't know, do you see my, my cursor moving around here? Good. Okay. So this is uh, a very young, that's a flower bud that's developing and it's starting to expand. So this is an immature flower that's developing. Um, <clears throat> then it'll go through this stage where it's starting to, it's kind of gone to a cream color and you see a little bit of purple color developing. Now it'll go to this stage where it's uh, more of a purple or kind of a lavender color. And it's beginning to age to like a, a lighter blue here and eventually um, can go to green or to brown. And so hydrangeas go through this color change, even the white ones, even smooth hydrangea, even oak leaf, even panicle, um, those flowers age from white to some other color. Uh, if it's very hot and very dry, they tend to go brown. If it's cooler or they're getting some water or they're in some shade, they will tend to go to either a deeper color or they can turn green. So that's not abnormal. That just means those those flowers are aging. Um, yeah, so don't don't worry. Everything's fine. We do also have some people asking about amending soil to have the flowers change to different colors. Okay, so um, I've, I've got my little cheat sheet here because I want to make sure I'm telling you this right because it can get a bit complicated and I don't want to give you bad information. 
So if we're talking about big leaf hydrangea, um, it's pH of the soil, but more accurately, it's aluminum availability within the soil that's affecting the flower color. So what does that mean? It means that if you have a more acidic soil, so if the pH is lower, say if it was in the range of a 5.0 to a 5.5, um, it makes the aluminum in the soil available to the plant. The plant takes that up and that aluminum binds with the, the pigments that are producing the color and it turns the plant blue, turns the flowers blue. Uh, if you have a more basic or a more alkaline soil with the, the pH number is higher, a 6 to 6.5, maybe, maybe a 7, um, then it makes the aluminum unavailable to the plant to take up and the color will tend to be a pink or a red. Now there's a lot of caveats to this because there are a few cultivars of big leaf hydrangea that regardless of the pH, regardless of aluminum availability, will tend to stay pink. Um, there are some that can't be changed to blue, but that's the minority. Um, so if you bought a plant that was pink, that means that it was probably grown in like a pine bark media or a peat moss media, and there was no aluminum in that media in the container, and so the plant's pink. Uh, oftentimes, simply planting that plant in the ground um, I would say a lot of us have an acidic soil and it's going to tend to turn blue. If you want the plant to stay pink, then you can add dolomitic limestone. You can amend the soil with lime and you're trying to raise the pH to make it more alkaline. And essentially that makes the aluminum in the soil unavailable to the plant. If you want to encourage the plant to turn blue or you want it to be a deeper blue, you can add aluminum sulfate and that will help to uh, create a bluer color. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing, uh, growing hydrangeas, big leaf hydrangea in a container, um, if you're growing it in a container in a soilless media, so you're not using dirt, you're using pine bark or you're using wood chips or you're using some kind of soilless potting mix, uh, then there is no aluminum there. So unless you add aluminum sulfate, <clears throat> regardless of the pH of that mix, the plant would be pink. Okay, a couple more questions here. Um, a lot of people asking for troubleshooting with um, why their hydrangeas haven't bloomed. Before we get into that, there's just a few quick questions. So one, what pollinator value do they have? Mm, um, I've seen a lot of insects attracted to hydrangeas. I, I don't know that there's really much nectar available. Um, this gets kind of complicated and I try to avoid uh, more technical terms, but I'm, I'm, I'll go here for just a minute. So if we, if we look at this plant, uh, this, I say it's a flower, it's really an inflorescence. It's a collection of flowers, but to be even more specific, what you see, the showy part, are actually sepals. They're not even petals. So these are essentially infertile flowers. So they're just showy structures. If we look within that, if we go to the center of this inflorescence and kind of peel back some of those sepals or think of them as flower petals and look underneath, you would have very small fertile flowers. That's what, that's, those are the very small flowers that actually have the reproductive parts. So any nectar that is available would be there. It wouldn't be uh, in the showy part. Now, you may have also seen uh, big leaf hydrangeas with a flat topped uh, flower structure or inflorescence that's called a lace cap, whereas the rounded is called a mop head. The lace cap, the entire center of that is made up of fertile flowers. So there would be more opportunity uh, probably for pollinators more available to them with a lace cap type uh, hydrangea instead of this this mop head. And how can I tell what kind of hydrangea I have if it doesn't have a label? Okay, so um, a few things you can do. Uh, if we look at this bottom picture, this is oak leaf hydrangea. It's given that name because it has a unique leaf shape. You see sort of deeply divided lobes. It looks sort of like a hand maybe or a, a, an oak leaf. That's why it has that name. So if you have this type of leaf structure, uh, then that's an oak leaf hydrangea. 
Uh, you can look at the shape of the flowers or the inflorescences, and that can help to key you in. Um, if you have this type of flower, but you have just a solid leaf, there's no lobes, then that's going to be a panicle hydrangea. Um, it can get a little bit more difficult between big leaf hydrangea and smooth hydrangea. Remember, this is a big leaf hydrangea up here. But if you have a white big leaf hydrangea, it may look also like a smooth hydrangea because their leaves are kind of similar. Um, but the leaves on smooth hydrangea have a more papery feel. If you were to rub the leaf, they're thinner. Uh, whereas if you rub the leaf on a big leaf hydrangea, it tends to be a little thicker, a little waxier, a little shinier. Um, there, there are some, I think, some pretty decent plant identification apps that you can get for like a smartphone where you can just take a picture of a plant. Um, you can also use some online keys to help key it out. Um, you can look up some different Google images of hydrangeas. Just be careful because depending on the source, it may be somewhat inaccurate. So just look at the source of that photograph. Uh, but generally, you can, you can key it out uh, that way. Thanks, Josh. Now we have a bunch of questions, people trying to figure out why their hydrangeas aren't flowering. So if you could just talk a little bit about some of the different reasons that your sure. plant might not flower, especially if a few people have mentioned afternoon sun. So if that's a factor. Yeah. Okay, so um, several reasons why hydrangeas don't flower. Um, a lot of what we've talked about here. So uh, remember hydrangeas are grown for their flowers. So really everything I'm telling you about selecting the right type, uh, pruning at the right time, giving the supplemental water and fertilizer are to encourage, it to help create the healthiest plant, but to encourage flowers. So any one of these things that's wrong can prevent or limit flowering. Something that we didn't really talk about, I may have just barely touched on this with oak leaf hydrangea, is cold hardiness. And cold hardiness is very complicated. You may have heard of USDA cold hardiness zones. There's a zone map for the entire United States. There's one for Virginia that kind of dials in with more, more detail. Uh, I believe we are in zone 6B. Uh, I say we, I'm here in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, so one thing even with cold hardiness though we have to keep in mind is that these zone maps are based on the average minimum winter temperature. It doesn't take into consideration things like an early frost. So we may be rocking along with warm temperatures through the summer. We might have a very warm fall. Um, and all of a sudden, boom, we have our first frost. And plants weren't hardened off properly. And that wasn't necessarily anything you did wrong. That's just something that happens in nature. We can also have temperature fluctuations through the winter. So plants are kind of coming in to dormancy, going out of dormancy as temperatures warm. And then we could have a cold snap that again has a really negative effect on plants. Um, as temperatures warm, even in winter, the saps flow in, the plant starts to work. And if we get cold again, it, it really uh, can have a detrimental effect to the plant. The same thing in spring. If, um, if we've warmed up early and then we have a late frost, uh, that can kill plants back and it can kill preformed flower buds and it can just set the plant back. I mean, my fruit trees uh, this year, I don't have any fruit because all of it was knocked off by a late frost. They had already flowered. We had a late frost and it killed all of those flowers. If we talk about big leaf hydrangea, um, most of the older cultivars, the ones that have been around for a while, flower on old growth. So that means that right now a lot of these plants are flowering and as soon as they finish they'll push out a little bit of new growth and they'll set flower buds for the next year. So if anything happens to that flower bud between now and next summer you don't get flowering. If the deer bite it off, if you prune it off, if the cold damages it, it kills the flower buds. Um, so there's a lot of different things that can cause it uh, but oftentimes it's due to uh, just a lot of stress on the plant from, you know, too much sun when it really needs more shade, not enough water, and something that damaged those flower buds, whether it was cold, uh, pruning at the wrong time, uh, deer browsing, any number of things like that. Thanks, Josh. We have a couple more questions here. Um, 
we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. If you do have a very specific question about your area, you can um, always reach out to your local extension office, your local master gardeners. And then I will also try to go back through the master gardener page and answer your questions. Um, so just to be respectful of Josh's time, one last question, should people deadhead their hydrangeas? Um, it's, that's a personal preference. Um, I do, but you don't have to. Um, so I, I would recommend deadheading uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, if you have like a wet summer, then those old flowers or spent flowers or dead flowers can be a source of some fungal infections as that's dead tissue. And so if we do go into like a wet summer and you've got a lot of old flowers that can uh, be the start of some fungal problems, uh, one, they just are somewhat unsightly. Um, two, if you, or I don't know, maybe I'm on three, I'll quit numbering my, my reasons. Uh, how about that? So, um, deadheading also with big leaf hydrangea and oak leaf hydrangea, you would do that in conjunction with pruning. So that would be the optimal time to prune those plants. So I would recommend that if you're going to prune those, then you're going to have to deadhead anyway. Uh, some of the things you can do though is you can cut hydrangea flowers as they start to age and bring those inside. You can dry them and you can enjoy them. You don't have to let them go totally brown on the plant. Uh, so the person that mentioned that their blue flowers are starting to turn green, that's actually a good time to go ahead and cut those off and dry them because uh, if they're going green not brown then you can preserve them for, for a pretty long time. So I would recommend deadheading. Uh, one final reason to do it is that um, if you don't, then the purpose of a flower is to produce seeds. Uh, it's not actually for us to enjoy. Um, so if you leave those on, then the plant is putting some energy into seed production instead of producing flower buds for the next year. Awesome, that was a really great presentation. Hopefully a lot of people learned um, some tips for their hydrangeas. As I said, if you have very specific questions, you can always reach out to your local extension office, master gardeners, and then I'll try to go back through and answer some of these questions um, that we have on here. I do wanna say, Josh talked about watering. We did do an entire um, get gardening presentation on watering. So that's a good one to go back. Um, and you can learn all about how that works if you are just doing a you know one small cup of water on your plant why that's bad for your plant um, next week we're going to have a session on planning your fall garden with galen johnson of hampton and that is going to be at 10 instead of 2 p.m so um, i'm going to do some reminder posts for that as well but that will be at 10 a.m rather than 2 p.m next thursday um, and we have these scheduled through the beginning of September. We're gonna do a whole series in August on home preservation. So look out for those. And thanks again to Josh for joining us today. Thank you all.